Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Nicholas and I'm very privileged today to have Professor Ramses Bugueran on. He's an experienced Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, very experienced competitor, a very experienced instructor, and a dear friend. He is the owner and head instructor at Living Art Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Willowbrook, Illinois. Welcome, Rams. Hi, thanks for having me. Coach Rams, if you could just give us a short little overview of your experience and training, and we'll move on from there. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, I, I found martial arts a little bit later in life. Uh, my sister signed herself up for some self-defense classes at a Hapkido school, which is a, a Korean martial art. And uh, that style of Hapkido did, you know, some striking, some like Steven Seagal style, you know, joint lock sort of things, some judo throws. And uh, what I became really enamored with was the ground stuff, which was all uh, borrowed from J Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, she signed herself up for that, and then some months later, uh, I can't remember why, but my parents and I decided to visit a class of hers, and then I decided I wanted to, to hop in, and this was maybe at the start of high school or something like that. And uh, I really liked, you know, martial arts training, but what I really liked out of what we did uh, at that school was the ground stuff and the grappling stuff. And then um, I trained uh, at that school uh, all through high school and then during college where I went to study first music education and then at uh, clarinet performance. I didn't do much of any sort of exercise or anything. I actually got kind of fat. Um, and uh, after graduating college, um, I uh, just found whatever job I could coming out of college as a music major, and that was selling memberships at LA Fitness. Um, and then I met a friend, uh, well, an eventual friend. He was hired two weeks after I was, and I noticed he had cauliflower ear, and then he told me he trained jiu-jitsu. He was a purple belt at the time, and then I just ended up following him around um, to where he trained jiu-jitsu. And at first, I was only able to train uh, one day a week with the work schedule I had then. And then uh, the schedule kept changing where I was able to train more and more, and then I eventually got fired from that job, and jiu-jitsu just became uh, more and more part of my life. And several years later, here I am uh, with a school. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Coach Rams, I'd like to focus this discussion on the beginner and recreational student, if that would be okay with you, because I know a lot of beginners and recreational jiu-jitsu players like myself have a lot of questions, and we could benefit from your from your advice, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, anything that I could do to make uh, the sport seem accessible. The sport is accessible, in my belief. Obviously, I have a bias. This is what I do for a living, but I think that we're under a good coach and in a good room with a good culture, um, jiu-jitsu can be accessible to people of all ages and all ability levels, men, women, children across the board. Um, but, you know, the challenges have to be scaled properly and the person ideally is introduced to it properly and introduced to, you know, each of the challenges uh, in a manner that makes sense, that is safe, so on and so forth. So, yeah, anything, if any, anything you ask me and anything I can say can help somebody out there know, make it seem more palatable, uh, make it seem like something they, they could actually do. Absolutely. Let's go for it. Great. My first question is, can you give us some general guidelines to follow regarding perhaps an appropriate age or proper age to start jujitsu? I know a lot of young children are very interested. Could you give us some guidelines? Um, well, I don't think uh, any age is really too young to to trick you know a <laughs> trick a little person in doing like you know the related movements or start learning something i think in a classroom setting from my experience it's difficult to work with children much younger than five um much younger than five and even sometimes you know that the average five-year-old um that's difficult to get much jujitsu done with them <laughs> and much jujitsu learning. And at least in the classroom setting, you know, they, they come in with their own agenda, you know, which is to have fun and blow off steam and, and play around in a, in a giant padded room. Um, I imagine, I don't have any kids um, at the moment. Uh, I imagine if I ever had a kid, uh, I would probably be, you know, wrestling around with him or her and, you know, making it fun to do like the jujitsu like movements um, but younger than five is tough. 
there have been some exceptions that uh, uh, I've accepted into class. Um, that uh, some some outliers there, kids that can follow directions pretty well and are, are coordinated um, above average for their age. Uh, but that would be on the lowest end, the student that uh, I could accept at my school in a classroom setting. Um, the oldest, uh, I mean, as long as you can still move a little bit, um, I think, uh, I can't, I'm, I'm going to mess up his age, but uh, I have a private student, um, Thomas Kent, who I believe he just turned 76. And, uh, you know, he's not doing the same stuff as 18-year-olds are doing. He's not cartwheel passing people or, you know, throwing flying arm bars on anybody, but he can train in a meaningful way and the training is good for him, um, good exercise, and uh, it's definitely not a waste of anyone's time. Um, he uh, has some injuries uh, that that prevent him from doing certain things, but that's because he had, you know, all of his life he's been lifting weights and playing sports and, you know, uh, burning the candle at both ends physically. So, you know, it's bound to catch up with us at some point, but he, he does train and uh, he's tough especially uh, all things considered. Um, my second oldest student, a uh, private student, would be Eric. Um, I don't know, I'm probably leaving out a few in between there, but these are the two that just jump out into my mind. He found jiu-jitsu, I believe, at 51 or 52 um, and uh, trained uh, privately with me. And it wasn't just jiu-jitsu that uh, did this for him, but he lost a bunch of weight. He got a lot stronger. He is a completely different body. Um, than what than what he started with when I first met him, and not all of that can be attributed to jujitsu training. He eats well and keeps a good uh, uh, exercise regimen um, outside of uh, the mat. But uh, yeah, um, age is not generally a factor, I don't think. At least I haven't uh, um, run into a student uh, old enough that I haven't been able to work with meaningfully in some capacity. Great, great. Thank you for that. And expounding on that, I think many beginner students or students interested in trying Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu are very intimidated trying to navigate how to choose a, a Jiu-Jitsu academy. Uh, I have a teenage uh, nephew and niece. What kind of guidelines or advice would you give to them as far as yellow flags, red flags, green flags to look for in a potential academy to train at? Um, so... That's a that's a good question. Um, to maybe to paint a little bit of context, um, the, so my my week on my worst day, I think I work, let's say four hours. Um, so if uh, the, on paper that's not a very long work day, so I expect myself to be dialed in for the classes that I'm teaching. I'm not. Uh, you know, playing around on my phone. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm paying attention to nearly everything that's happening on the mat. That, that's doubly true for uh, if it's a kid's class because, you know, little bodies will find all sorts of creative ways to uh, kind of headbutt each other, hurt each other, hurt themselves. So they really do need um, uh, somebody that's, that's watching. Uh, and the adult class too, I can relax because obviously everyone in the room is an adult or a teenager and I, I don't have to be worried that they're going to, you know, run into the brick wall of well, Naruto running or something like that. Um, but, uh, an instructor that, you know, is paying attention from start to finish, uh, of the class. And I also am of the belief that like, a Jiu Jitsu is a, it's a vast landscape of techniques and maneuvers and motions. And there's like a lot of data that uh, needs to be, needs to be taught. Um, and a, and a, a, the average jujitsu class is around an, an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes on the longer end, two hours. And generally for half of that, we are sparring. Um, so that leaves you between 45 minutes and an hour to learn something uh, that's as complicated as playing the piano. Um, so if uh, you go to a school and, first of all, if the instructor's not really, doesn't really seem mentally dialed in, that's a big red flag. Or if you go to a school and uh, they make you do a bunch of calisthenics and jumping jacks and, I'm so sorry, you might have to edit that bit out. We have a, <laughs> um, a clock uh, that uh, makes bird noises at the start of every hour. <laughs> 
anyway. No problem. Um, uh, so yeah, if uh, the instructor is making you do a bunch of like, you know, makes you do push-ups or you know, fireman's carries, bear crawls, all of this other stuff, um, the need for a warm-up, there is a need for a warm-up, but uh, that should be relevant to the techniques being taught that day. Um, there's just too much to get through, and if you know, you're taking 20 minutes to to work the class out, you're gonna have 20 to 25 minutes to teach real technique that's not really a meaningful amount of time for instruction or giving them time to to rep the moves um, how a uh, an instructor treats his students is also really important like uh, if you went to, to a Starbucks and they were rude to you you know they the coffee was made wrong you know they, they said no that's just how it is if you don't like it that's on you um, I I would like to see uh, in the future, in the very near future, that um, jujitsu gyms and jujitsu instructors are held to the same kind of customer service standard as every other industry. As I've seen it happen uh, way too often, where the person at the head of the room, you know, gets comfortable with all of the adulation thrown at him or her, and then they start, you know, mildly to severely uh, disrespecting their students. And it's, uh, I know that dynamic can get a little bit difficult because, you know, uh, let's say you have a, a purple belt. So that takes you know, at least three or four years to get a purple belt. So you've had a, a three or four years relationship with the person. You know, everybody has a bad day here or there, but uh, um, there should be a, a high level of respect between all members of the community uh, in a gym, especially from the coach, you know, as at the end of the day, uh, we are there to serve you. You know, you have uh, exchanged your hard-earned month, your hard-earned dollar for good instruction, a safe room, and uh, at le at the very least, uh, the same level of respect you would afford a, a stranger. Um, I feel like I, I, w I went long there. <laughs> um, I could think of uh, some green flags would be. Um, yeah, if, a, if, if it's a personable person, you know, personable guy or, or lady, um, treats their students respectfully, doesn't waste your time with an overly long warm-up, um, and is uh, looking out for the safety of the students. Um, especially when my school was new, I uh, stressed a lot about the, about the matchups that were happening in the class, both for practicing of technique and for uh, sparring. If I saw pe two people that were inexperienced or that were pretty new within their first month of training, I would make sure that they didn't have to roll each other. Uh, they would either roll me or a, another more experienced student. Um, you've got to be looking out for you've got to be looking out for stuff like that. And I think it's important for uh, to see an instructor at least doing some of the matchups, you know, not not totally leaving it to to chance, um, and be looking out especially for the for the newer incoming student because that's, you know, when the risk of injury is highest. But it's also um, a, a risk factor that's really easily mitigated. It just takes some attention. Um, let's see, I feel like I feel like it went a little long. Do you think there's something I, uh, I could have covered a little more thoroughly or something you'd like me to cover a little more thoroughly? No, no, that was, that was excellent advice, Coach. Really appreciate it. Um, Regarding beginner students, let's say a 25-year-old with absolutely no grappling experience, we all know that grappling fitness is completely different from traditional fitness like running, etc. What are some guidelines as far as how often a beginner student should train as far as the number of times per, per week so that they can adapt while still recovering and not overtraining? What are some guidelines you would give? Well, every body is different, um, and when I uh, found uh, martial arts or when I found jiu-jitsu, um, I, I wasn't terribly athletic myself. I had done a little martial arts in high school, but then long enough went by that I was basically starting at zero. Um, I think I'm fortunate in that, uh, you know, I had good, like, genetic potential for certain things. Like, you know, I'm okay strong. I'm okay flexible. Um, I'm pretty durable, um, but... Uh, I think you just have to, to, to feel it out for yourself. If you're 
way sore. It was like super, super sore after a night of training. Um, then respect your, respect your body and give yourself a day to recover. Um, make sure you're getting good sleep, good, uh, nutrition and sleep is, a uh, something I, I neglected for way too long, especially in my formative years of uh, people are a lot more aware now of how important sleep is. Whereas, uh, when I came up, it was a little bit more the culture of, you know, uh, you know, gr- grind it out, power through whatever, whatever hurts, you know, any sort of discomfort and work hard, even at the expense of sleep. Now we know better and it would just be good to, for new people to, uh, to have that emphasized for but absolutely respect your recovery time. Absolutely respect your sleep. Um, but if you're enthusiastic about training and you have the, the time and the schedule that allows you to, to train often, train as often as you like, but uh, respect whatever whatever your body asks of you in terms of recovery. I would say for uh, if uh, you know your your client avatar that you just painted there, a 25 year old with no grappling experience, no no fitness experience, um, probably twice a week to start, see how you feel. Um, three times a week is a uh, is, is not a bad average to to keep up if uh, jujitsu is merely a hobby of yours. Um, but then again, it is a complicated sport. There is a lot of data. And if you real, feel really enthusiastic about learning and getting better, come as often as, uh, uh, as your body will allow you to. And also, you will, at a certain point, this might be, you know, into, in, into your later belts, like a blue belt or a purple belt, where jiu-jitsu training by itself is not quite so physically taxing because you are a lot more efficient of a practitioner. You know when it's appropriate to to squeeze and pull and push with max effort, and you know when it's uh, appropriate to to save your energy. And there's been, you know, training sessions that I've had at at the blue or purple belt level where this wasn't really quite a workout. You know, I I realized at the end of the session because, you know, uh, I was able to get away with using mostly technique and efficiency um and the only way you get there is by you know coming to class and and training and learning how to how to make yourself move efficiently so um maybe not maybe a little more complicated answer than than i needed to give but uh respect your body come in as often as you feel you're enthusiastic about um but keeping in mind all of those other things like sleep and nutrition and uh yeah, I guess a balanced with the rest of your life. Like uh, when I found jujitsu, uh, it ended up working out okay. This is what I do for a living, but I, I really liked it a lot, and I feel like I almost got a bit addicted to it. Um, and I trained at the expense of all other all other things, um, and ended up working out okay for me. But uh, I imagine there's probably some stories out there where it, it didn't work out for somebody, and uh, it was. Uh, as much as it was a positive force for their life, you know, they neglected other areas of their life and it could be a little bit of a negative there as well. Um, But yeah. Great. Great. That was great advice. I really like how you incorporated high quality nutrition, hydration, high quality sleep, which as you know, other than genetics is the most powerful anabolic stimulus known. That's terrific. And expounding on that coach Rams, um, what are some guidelines as far as, for example, that avatar, the 25-year-old beginner student, what are, what's the dynamic for incorporating some off-mat strength and conditioning concepts to assist this student in his jiu-jitsu journey or her journey? Um, I think if the goal is uh, just uh, health and longevity, uh, there's, there's certain things that we end up doing a lot of in jiu-jitsu. Like if it's a, this person that's had no other athletic background, uh, let's say they come to my school, I end up uh, teaching people how to use their legs first. I, I put them on their back and uh, they learn how to use their guard first. So uh, being a, a a room of of mostly guard players, and that's what jiu-jitsu is, it's a lot of people on their back or on their butt crunched up in a, in a, in a flexed position. You want to spend some time doing uh, mobility work, um, opening yourself up, anything that's uh, extension, um, and since we're just talking on the phone, you know, hard to give you examples of specific exercises. Also, that's a little out of my purview. I know what what's uh, good for my body, but I don't feel qualified enough to give uh, 
specific advice on that. But I do know that we spent a lot of time crunched up in a little ball, um, so uh, doing the opposite and uh, any exercises uh, you can do to counteract that is a good idea. Um, but outside of that, the, the basic strength and conditioning stuff will help you on the mat as well, not only for your performance on the mat, but for uh, preventing injury and uh, just your overall durability. If you spend some time in the weight room doing the basic stuff, the basic presses, and pulls, and uh, compound movements, I think that'll go a long way um, without having to get crazy in the weeds of, uh, you know, sports-specific stuff. Um, Great. And, uh, I'd say that uh, with a like, if you were going to train jujitsu as much as you possibly could, you wanted to train five or six days a week uh, jujitsu. Uh, I would say between one and three um, lifting sessions a week. But that is a really high uh, volume of training. Not if you're getting ready for a major tournament or something like that. That's what you probably want to be doing. Um, if you're just like a, a go-getter type of person, uh, you could you know, think about a volume similar to that, but, um, at, at my age and at my, uh, you know, stage in my, in my career, I find that if I'm training at that high a volume, something usually starts falling apart. Um, luckily it's not, not usually injury, but I do, uh, uh tend to overtrain myself a bit here and there. Like if I do one or too many jujitsu sessions and lifting sessions in the week. There's going to be one night of the week where I just am too overtrained and it's even hard to fall asleep. Um, so on the, on the high end of a, of a younger person's, uh, you know, capacity, somebody that's not on steroids or anything like that, um, five to six days a week of, of a hard jujitsu training that includes hard sparring, uh, you're probably only going to be able to do one to three lifting sessions in the week on top of that. And that's going to be more or less the upper limit of, of most people. Um, of course, a hobbyist can train less than that. Um, you'll probably be okay. Uh, but that's that's about the range for the, the upper range for my body. Got it. Great advice. Great advice. And expounding on that, Coach Rams, let's say a, a recreational student who trains two to three times a week approaches you at your academy and wants to transition into a competitor. I think a lot of students are interested in competing. They just don't know what process to go through to prepare themselves. What are some general guidelines you would give a student of yours? So general guidelines, uh, let's, uh, let's frame it uh, through the perspective of somebody that – it started jiu-jitsu with me and it wants to get ready for for their first tournament maybe not necessarily become a full-time competitor because i haven't had anybody in my school uh come forward with that interest yet uh but i do have a, a handful of beginners i have had a handful of beginners that eventually got interested in, in trying out their first turn so i would recommend that you want to be training at the bottom end at least six months before you give it your first go at a tournament and um, probably closer to, to eight months or nine months or even maybe a, maybe a year. Um, Cause there's just a lot of, a lot to learn and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of ways you can lose a match. You can lose by points. You can learn by lose by any number of submissions. Uh, and even the rule system can get a little bit uh, complicated. It takes, it takes a while to learn like uh, all the ins and outs of the rules and, you know, how one can, can game the system and win or lose by strategy. Uh, so before six months, I think it's a, not a waste of time, but I, I feel as an instructor, I might not have had the chance to, to prepare a person to the level where um, they're not, they might not get taken out by something I just hadn't gotten to yet. Um, so six months or more, but six months is really the the lower end of the of the range. And uh, since, like I, I said earlier, jujitsu is vast. There's a lot to learn. Um, I would advise uh, the student to pick a, pick a tournament that has a lot of lead time, especially if it's their first tournament, like three or four months out or something like that. And uh, so let's say they picked the a tournament four months out. Uh, the three months prior to the final month, uh, keep, I would advise them to keep it explorative. Don't go you know, balls to the wall with their intensity. Um, 
keep trying and learning new things as much as possible because it's uh, like I said, jujitsu is vast, um, and it doesn't make sense to to be only playing your A game and uh, closing yourself off to uh, new techniques and new possibilities uh, for so long for a tournament. Uh, but for the final month, um, the last four weeks out, maybe even six weeks, uh, I would advise them to roll uh, like it matters every time. I'm not saying a thousand percent or, or competition speed, uh, but to keep score mentally if it's a pointed rule set that they're preparing for, um, to uh, try to use only their A game or whatever they they think is their A game. Um, for the last four weeks of training. And obviously safety is a thing we have to keep in mind. You don't need to be blasting your training partners a thousand percent every role, but the, the intensity does have to get bumped up so that you learn the, the speed of competition. So you have a lot of practice with the speed of competition. Um, and then, yeah, that would be the, the most general of guidelines. And uh, if we want to go more specifically into like technique and strategy, I would uh, encourage them to find out uh, uh, how they would like to start a match. Um, with our, you know, sp specific avatar that we picked right now, uh, they, with no rustling experience, I would say they probably want to uh, nail down their guard pulling strategy. Or if it's somebody that uh, really does feel more comfortable on their feet and really took to to, uh, to training takedowns, uh, I would. Um, encourage them to find uh, and refine their their one or two best takedowns because we can always choose how we start a match. After that, it's in uh, the universe's hands. You know, you just have to be prepared for a lot, which is another reason I I say you don't want to be uh, trying a tournament with less than six months of experience, even though that number is probably closer to eight, nine, ten months. But uh, yeah. Uh, if it's a four month camp, the first three months is still playful and explorative. The last month, dial up the intensity, figure out if you want to play takedowns, which takedowns you want to, you want to go for and, uh, figure out if you want to pull guard, how you want to pull guard and which guard you want to pull to. And, uh, especially for somebody's first tournament, um, usually at the white belt level and at the blue belt level, the person that is most aggressive tends to win and the person that scores first tends to win. So I, I was jokingly tell my guys, it's a, uh, it's Cobra Kai rules, you know, strike first, strike fast, no mercy. You know, obviously I'm joking. I don't mean, you know, for them to be malicious, malicious or unsportsman or anything like that. But generally the person that fires off their attacks first and is the most assertive, whether they are the more technical practitioner, and sometimes you can tell they're not, um, they, the, the match favors them. They tend to win. Not always, but that's, that's what I've seen. Great advice, great advice. Um, the next thing I wanted to pick your brain about, Coach Rams, is, you know, we all have lives outside of jiu-jitsu, families, injuries. I think one of the most difficult things for any jiu-jitsu athlete <laughs> is – coming back to the mat, coming back to training after a long layoff due to having a baby or an injury. And students feel strange and they feel like they've regressed while their teammates have improved. What would you give as far as some general guidelines for students coming back from a long layoff, either due to injury or life circumstances? And how can not only the coach, but the, the athlete's teammates help them get back into the groove of things? Um, well, I think uh, I think it has a little bit less to do with the teammates. Um, maybe it has a little bit to do with the coach. I'd say if I, if I knew a student was coming back and they were pretty out of shape, uh, it also has to do with the, a little bit the person. If the person is, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't uh, have a lot of experience with their with their ego being super prominent, it has to do with their temperament as well. If I know a person has like a really, um, I guess for lack of a better term, a hot temperament, like they, they only have one gear, they go hard and that's the only way they know how to go. Um, then I would look out for them. I would, uh, you know, uh, pair them with, pair them with people that are mindful training partners that can, you know, keep the match safe. Or I would myself roll with them to kind of 
tear them back into the the groove of things. Uh, but it has more to do with the, the individual. If if uh, if you've taken a long layoff and you're coming back in, um, and you know you're out of shape, just know that you're gonna you're going to lose more than you win. You're going to get tired much quicker than you think, and just don't let that affect you emotionally. It's part of the process. It's also part of what made it fun initially. Um, I remember, you know, I one of the one of the benefits of finding jujitsu a little bit later in life is I, I kind of still remember what it was to be new. And one of the fun things about it was how hard it was and how tired you got. So uh, learn to enjoy those things. It's uh, there's there's the joy of effort, you know, the joy of of the sweat and the joy of you know the of, of adversity. And even if you even if you lose the exchanges, you, you get tapped in sparring a few times, it's, it's not a big deal. You know, everyone in the room still loves you. The, the coach still appreciates that you're there. Um, and if it's a good, a good culture and a good room, you know, nobody's going to be trying to kick your ass when you're, <laughs> when you're out of shape and coming back to the gym. Hopefully it's, uh, it's, it's still hard, and, but it's still playful and it's still good spirited. Um, and if I, and it, as as an instructor, if I see that it is not that, I would try to, you know, steer steer that student uh, away from a bad situation. But um, I'm not, at least in my room in my in my school, I wouldn't be terribly concerned of, of anybody hurting the student or anybody, you know, going too hard. My only my only concern would be if that student pushes themselves too hard. So I would, you know, just keep reminding them to hey, take it as easy as you need to. There's no need to to vomit on my mat, you know, <laughs> take it, uh, take it light, do, do as, as much or as little as you feel comfortable with. I'm here if you want uh, a safe role, that sort of thing. And I feel like I might have gotten away from the, the root of the question. Uh, did, did I, did I more or less cover, cover what you asked or did I, did I go off into la la land? No, you did. That that's that's great advice. I appreciate that. Uh, we're all smarter for for hearing that. Um, regarding any closing thoughts, is there any high yield advice that you would give to beginner and recreational students that perhaps you think is really important that we haven't covered here? Please, we're all learning from you. High yield advice for a beginner. Um, let's see. Uh, it's 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 good to. Try the move of the day or the moves of the day um, as often as you can on the day you learn it. Um, it's also going to be the most difficult uh, to pull those move off, moves off successfully because hopefully that's also what everybody else is trying and what everybody else sees coming. Um, there's going to be times where violence is necessary, where like you know you're caught in a bad spot and the only the only answer the only right answer is also the only hard answer, but more often than not, you can uh, think your way out of problems and find a low effort solution. Um, try to move as deliberately as possible, especially when you're new. Don't jump into things, throw your weight into things, spin in or out of things. Uh, try to uh, control your motions and actions uh, to what you can reasonably predict the outcome of. Um, just being a little too a little too wild, um, which is you know this is kind of the nature of things. New people are a little unpredictable, a little wild, and that's just how it is. But uh, if a beginner could do whatever they can to um, think through a situation and uh, move as deliberately as possible, that'll be some that'll be an attitude that uh, uh, pays dividends in the long run for for learning, for safety, and technique development. And uh, also, you're you're going to have more more training partners that are more enthusiastic about training with you if uh, they know they're not going to catch knees and elbows <laughs> um, while they're while they're rolling with you. Um, that'd probably be one of the one of the bigger ones. Um, let's see. That that that'd probably be the top of the list uh, for high yield advice. Uh, tap early. Tap often. Um, do, Tapping doesn't mean, you know, you lost or your ego should take a hit. It just means, you know, you got caught. You we're hitting the reset button so we can play again. Um, and it's one of the uh, – it's a very important learning tool. Um, if you don't tap or if you're, you know, 
resistant to tapping, resistant to recognizing when you've gotten caught with something that's dangerous, uh, it's just not going to be a very productive training partner, and it's not going to be a productive habit for yourself. Tapping is totally fine, even if it's not something that's a quote-unquote a legitimate submission. Um, I have uh, three um, damaged discs in my in my neck. And uh, while, you know, I've been doing jiu-jitsu for a long time, training hard and so on and so forth, I, 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 I'm thinking, I'm guessing that uh, the damage I took to my neck was probably pretty avoidable. I was just, I was a, a flat half guard player for a long time, a deep half guard player for a long time. And that uh, means you get, you end up getting cross-faced a bunch, especially when you're learning how to, you know, manage the distance and, you know, refine your moves from there. So if you're underneath somebody and they're just laying into your neck with shoulder pressure, that's something you can survive and, and get through. But you ask yourself if it's, if it's worth it. <laughs> um, you could tap to something that's not a legitimate submission, save your body some mileage, and then just learn how to not get caught there again. Um, I have a, a, a training partner who um, uh, they – they don't have much visible cauliflower ear, but they're very good uh, because uh, their significant other at the time uh, during their formative years told them to wear ear guards um, so that they wouldn't get cauliflower ear. And then this person made it through white, blue, purple belt, and then he got sick of wearing ear guards. And I think they he broke up with that significant other and he stopped wearing um, the ear guards. Um, now the person is very good and, they're just not going to, they're probably just not going to get cauliflower ear unless they, you know, spar somebody that's much bigger than them, much more experienced than them and much meaner. And also if this person just doesn't know well enough to tap when their head is getting squeezed. So that I told that little anecdote just to, uh, to outline that you don't necessarily have to beat your body up to, to get tough and to get really good at jujitsu. Um, yeah, I hope that that helped. I hope that answered the question. This is great advice. I really appreciate it, and uh, I really appreciate your time uh, today. Where can people find you? Can you give us the address of your academy, social media? How can people reach out to you? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so it's Living Art Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in Willowbrook, Illinois. It's by uh, Darian. It's just south of Hinsdale, just north of Burr Ridge, uh, Illinois. Uh, the address is 7886 South Quincy Street, um, and you can find us on uh, Instagram and Facebook under Living Art BJJ. Um, yeah, I'm pr hopefully pretty pretty easy to find on on the internet if I've done my job well. <laughs> this is terrific, uh, Professor Coach Rams. We we really really appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much for this. Oh, thank you for thank you for having me, and I hope uh, I hope I hope this helps. I hope uh, hope people uh, want to hear it. Thank you.